You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Probation officers have to determine uh, restitution, identify the victims for the restitution. And this is a complicated process, made more complicated by the enactment of the Mandatory Re Victims Restitution Act of 1996. It's taken on a different component, and um, basically we have a lot of questions uh, with restitution, how it's uh, divided up, how it's uh, incorporated into the pre-sentence uh, process, and uh, it's, it's crucial to us that we know how to, how to implement it properly. In the pre-sentence reports, there's a, a section as far as determining restitution, and I thought the five steps in determining restitution would be very helpful in our job as pre-sentence report writing. I think it's important that they uh, consider that the purpose of restitution is to put the uh, victims back in the uh, position that they were in uh, prior to the date of the offense, not to uh, make them anything uh, beyond whole, uh, not uh, more than whole, but just, just whole. Now, from the Federal Judiciary's Teletraining Studio in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center presents Restitution, Determining Victims and Harms. Hello and welcome. I'm Lauren Woods with the Federal Judicial Center, and we're especially excited that you're joining us today in this, our first teletraining program produced in collaboration with the United States Sentencing Commission and the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. We have 25 sites signed up with us today for Push to Talk, so that means we should cover a little administrative details first. First off, if you're going to use the Push to Talk mic, please make sure you identify yourself and your site. This will help us for a couple of reasons. First, it will let everybody know who's talking, and second, it will help in the event, unlikely as it might be, we hope, that two or more sites uh, might want to talk at the same time. If that should happen, you'll see a, a timeout signal from our presenters, and that would be your cue then to release the microphone, stop talking, and let the presenters call on each other, or call on you rather, by sight. Um, also with that, in addition to our push to talk sites, we have with us today approximately 60 uh, view only sites, and maybe even more than that, and we want you to participate as well. And to do that, that's yeah, why we've that's included why. a fax form in our um, materials, our handout materials today. So uh, any site can, whether you're push to talk or view only, feel free to fax at any time throughout the program. Um, now to make sure our push to talk <coughs> system is up and running, I'd just like to do a modified roll call really quick, only hit a couple of those 25 sites, uh, just to let our presenters know that there is actually somebody out there listening, okay? Uh, so if I call on you, uh, if you would please uh, just uh, answer, okay? Um, I'd like to check first with the East Coast, and I believe we have Concord, New Hampshire with us today. Concord, are you there? Okay. Um, actually, I've heard that somebody out there has a toggle switch that's open, and if you could please just turn that the, uh, off. And you know, please make sure that it's in the off position. That will help reduce any of the feedback that you might be having. Um, why don't we move on to the Midwest is Chicago. Chicago should be with us here today. Are you there, Chicago? Hello? We're here. We're here. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, also, out on the West Coast, uh, Sacramento, I think, uh, is joining us today. Sacramento, are you there? It's actually Fresno, California. Oh, great. Okay. Well, terrific. Well, Fresno, that's wonderful, too. I'm glad you're joining us today. Also, um, one other final technical detail. If you're experiencing any trouble viewing the broadcast, um, please contact SpaceNet at the number that will be on your screen. That's 1-800-770-2887. And um, we really can't help you here in the studio if you have a problem viewing the broadcast. That's why you'd have to call SpaceNet, okay? Um, finally, I uh, just want to touch on some agenda items. The agenda is actually pretty simple. For the next two hours, we're going to be discussing restitution. About halfway through the program, we'll take a five-minute break. And if you've ever attended a live, or well, this is live, but if you've ever attended a face-to-face -face seminar, um, you know that after the program, sometimes folks like to hang around after class and talk to the, the instructors, presenters, to clarify a point or you know, to ask additional questions. 
Well, we'd like to provide you that opportunity here today, and if you have the time, our presenters will be available here after the two-hour presentation for an additional half hour to answer any push-to-talk or uh, fax questions that you might have regarding restitution. Now, our goal today is pretty simple. We want to provide you with a tool, a roadmap, to help you determine victims and harms when you're analyzing restitution. Now, last May, the United States Sentencing Commission and the Federal Bar Association sponsored the 8th Annual Seminar on Federal Sentencing Guidelines. And while that was going on, Frank Larry from the United States Sentencing Commission was able to sit down and chat with the uh, seminar's program moderator, Jim Fellman, who's also a defense attorney, and discuss why restitution is just so important. There seems to be a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in restitution as a topic, and um, I was curious, what exactly was the impetus for the panel on uh, restitution? Increasingly, people have come to realize that restitution is a very important part of a defendant's sentence. Everybody in the process has got to focus first on the element of incarceration. Uh, increasingly, particularly with the advent of mandatory restitution, however, uh, assuming there is an incarceration portion, uh, when that is over, uh, or if it's a probationary matter, uh, it's very important to the defendant, uh, what does my life look like now? Uh, can I go about my affairs? Have I paid my debt to society? Or uh, do I have a very, very large restitution obligation out there that I may or may not have the immediate ability to repay? And it's a very important part of the sentencing process. It's just one that doesn't catch everybody's attention at the time because it's usually something for down the road later. And one of our objectives in adding this particular uh, topic as a panel is to try to better <coughs> educate the attorneys on the importance of restitution uh, to their clients and to their ability to go on with their life or not and the, and the importance of, of that issue uh, to their clients and how to better represent their clients. And obviously we have a lot of probation officers who have a lot of questions about the technical aspects of how to calculate restitution. And we hope to better educate them with, uh, with our program as well. Great. Thank you very much. You're Mr. welcome. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. We'll be seeing more from that seminar throughout today's broadcast. But now, without further ado, I should like to introduce to you our presenters today. Actually, they probably don't need any introduction. I'm sure they're familiar to most of you. We have Kathy Goodwin from the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Uh, Kathy's an Assistant General Counsel. She's been with the courts since 1993. And prior to which, she was an Assistant U.S. Attorney. And joining her today is Rusty Burris, uh, who definitely needs no introduction, I'm sure. And he is a uh, principal advisor with the Sentencing Commission, has been there since the beginning in 1985. And prior to that, Rusty was a U.S. probation officer. So without further ado, Kathy and Rusty. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're happy to have you join us today in a discussion of restitution. And Kathy, once again, I'm glad to be working with you. Thank you. Glad to be here. You know, there's a lot of interest in restitution at the FJC and at the AO and at the Sentencing <coughs> Commission. We get a lot of questions about restitution. Uh, we're frequently asked to come out and do training about restitution. Uh, so we know the interest that exists out there in the area of restitution. Uh, basically, the guidelines are really uncomplicated regarding restitution. Uh, they say that if you have an identifiable victim, uh, then full restitution should be ordered. Of course, the application of the sentencing guidelines must fall within any restrictions or requirements that are set by the statutes. And it's there where we find that people are having some uncertainty and some questions and some complications. So it turns out that maybe it's not so much an issue of guidelines application, but it really is a matter of statutory interpretation. There we go, matter of statutory interpretation. Uh, so it is uh, the statute that we're going to be focusing on primarily here today. So for those of you that have had some uncertainties about the statutes, some questions about the statutes, uh, there is a little bit of relief actually. Uh, because Kathy has done just a tremendous job in developing a document uh, that looks at the statutory language regarding restitution, and then she looks at the cases that have developed uh, that are interpreting these statutes. And Kathy, would you spend just a couple of minutes telling us about this document? Yes, thank you. You should have a document that the cover page looks like this. It's called Determining 
Victims and Harms for Restitution in Federal Criminal Cases. It's about 40 pages long. The first about 10 or so we're going to be referring to off and on. I will be mentioning page numbers having to do with uh, case sites that you'll be able to find for future reference on those tables so, uh, in that handout. So you may want to even just jot the page number of the handout on, the, on your notes as you go. But they will be on the pages referred to in the first half. The second half of the document is actually an excerpt of, of the article I wrote for federal probation in December of 98 on restitution. It's a shortened version of it. Uh, and the more recent cases, of course, are not in that excerpt, but they are in the first few pages that we're going to be referring to. OK, good. Uh, in developing her document, Kathy has also done us another service. And that is, she has come up with a five-step process, an analysis for determining restitution. And I think those that have been exposed to this five-step process thus far and have tried to utilize it have found that it is helpful. Because we're finding that restitution, the determination, is easier when analyzed in steps. Now, as we go through and look at these steps, we'll find that the primary issues that arise and that are addressed are determination of victims, the causation of harms, and compensable harms. You know, speaking of questions of restitution reminds me of an experience that was recently shared at the National Sentencing Seminar by Judge Billy Wilkins of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Judge Wilkins is the incoming chair of the Criminal Law Committee and was the original chair of the U.S. Sentencing Commission. Let's go to the videotape and see the experience Judge Wilkins shared with restitution. When I, uh, when I went on the federal bench, uh, I assumed that I would uh, receive uh, at least some measure of respect from my colleagues at the bar and from the public in general. I guess to some degree that's been true. Let me give you a good example of that. Uh, Right after the first of this year, I received a letter from a fellow named John Miles. John lives in Dillon, South Carolina. That's across the state from where I live. And I don't know John, and he doesn't know me, but he evidently has seen my name in a newspaper somewhere. And he, he wrote a letter to me describing the fact that his car had been stolen. The FBI had traced his stolen car across the border into North Carolina, where he had been cut up in a chop shop and disposed of. And in his letter, he asked me, the bottom line was, will the court pay for my car? I wrote John back a letter, and I told him I couldn't comment about his particular case, but I did describe the, the guideline sections dealing with restitution and the federal statutes dealing with that and assured him that uh, I felt like that uh, restitution would be made, and I, I wished him good luck. Three weeks ago, I received a reply to my letter from John, and it touched me so I brought it with me. It's only three or four lines. I want to share it with you if you'll permit me. It's written on Blue Horse notebook paper. He didn't misspell my name, but I'm sure he knew to whom he was writing. And he says this, Dear Judge Wilkins, yesterday I went to court. I showed them your letter. They did not give me nothing. <laughs> so thanks a lot, you no good, dirty dog. Signed, John Miles. <laughs> well, at least John took time to write. Well, Kathy, I just hope we have more success in uh, conveying information about restitution than Judge Wilkins apparently did in that instance. Uh, you know, before we look at the five steps and have Kathy go through those, uh, let me give just a word of, of note. Uh, I know that most of you that are watching with us here today and participating uh, have expertise in guidelines application. And so necessarily, you have an understanding of relevant conduct. And as you go through your guidelines application, you make your determination of the offense level, uh, you're going through an analysis, a relevant conduct analysis, holding the defendant accountable for certain things, things the defendant has done or maybe that others have done during the offense of conviction or in preparation or in avoiding detection or responsibility. Sometimes you're even looking to the course of conduct or the common scheme or plan. And this analysis of relevant conduct serves you well in your guidelines application. But as you begin going through this analysis we're going to look at for restitution, this five-step analysis, you would do well to set aside this relevant conduct analysis because you're going to see that the analysis for relevant conduct is not identical to this analysis we're going to be using for restitution. And in fact, and in fact, uh, the determination of restitution is distinct from the determinations of the relevant conduct harms. 
So, Kathy, with that reminder in mind, and what better place to keep a reminder, uh, how about going through the five steps for us? Thank you. For each case that you work on, we suggest you follow the following steps. Um, beginning with the first one, which is to simply determine, are you dealing with mandatory or discretionary restitution in this case? And sometimes it will be neither, but we'll address some, uh, how you can impose restitution in those cases as well. But determine which statute you're working under. Second step, identify the victims for restitution purposes uh, for your particular case within the scope of your offensive conviction. The third step is to identify the harms to those victims. So you stick with the victims you've already identified and go to the harms uh, suffered by those victims as a consequence of the relevant conduct. The fourth step is to determine which of those harms, and sometimes there are an additional costs that we'll discuss, are compensable as restitution according to the statutes. These are very tightly tied to the statutes at this step. And then lastly, when you've completed steps one through four, step back and look at your plea agreement in your case and see if it allows you to impose a broader restitution than you could otherwise impose using steps one through four. Now, before we go through these steps, we found, Rusty, that this works better when you have a fact scenario to apply it to. Yes, it and does. we've generated a fact scenario uh, that we hope you all have had a chance to read. Uh, it has to do with the bank robbery. It's in the materials. But in case you haven't had a chance to read it, or for those of you that have read it would like to have a refresher, we have prepared a summary of the scenario for you to listen to at this time. Defendant D was convicted of armed bank robbery for the May 1, 1999 robbery of Friendly Neighborhood Bank. In the plea agreement, the government agreed not to pursue any additional charges, and D agreed to pay full restitution. D claims indigence. However, based on earning potential, it appears that he has the ability to pay $5,000 during incarceration and supervision. Just prior to going to the bank, D had stolen a $10,000 car for his getaway. It was ultimately recovered and returned to its owner, but it sustained $2,000 damage. Upon entering the bank, D pointing a revolver at the tellers smashed through the door to the teller's cage, causing $1,000 damage. D then took $20,000 from the teller drawers, of which $10,000 was later recovered. At the same time, he destroyed the bank's $150,000 security system. The destruction of that video security system required the bank to replace it. While a basic system can be purchased for $40,000, it no longer meets banking regulations minimum security requirements. A system meeting minimum requirements now costs $225,000. Yet, to save long-term costs, the bank's policy has been to purchase state-of-the-art systems. Therefore, the bank replaced the destroyed system with a state-of-the-art system costing $300,000. During the robbery, Dee encountered three bank employees and a bank customer. As he headed toward the teller drawers, Dee shoved teller A, causing her to fall, lacerating her leg. Her lacerations were treated at the hospital where initially she would only be hospitalized overnight at a cost of $3,000. However, she contracted a serious staph infection resulting in seven more days of hospitalization, increasing her medical bills an additional $15,000. Teller A also missed work as a result of the medical treatments, and the salary paid to her by the bank while on sick leave was $800. In addition, Teller A had expenses of $300 related to court appearances. The second bank employee, Teller B, was intimidated by D as D ordered him to open the teller drawer. As a result of the psychological trauma, Teller B required $4,000 in psychiatric treatments. He missed no work but like Teller A, spent $300 for court appearances. D ordered the third bank employee, Teller C, to lay face down on the floor, yet she reported no physical or psychological injuries and did not miss any work, and she too spent $300 for related court appearances. The bank customer while standing in line was roughed up by D, who then took from him a deposit bag containing $1,000. The bank customer was examined by paramedics on the scene, but required no professional medical treatment. Finally, like the other witnesses, the bank customer spent $300 on subsequent court appearances. 
And we're going to be asking you questions as we work through these five steps with this scenario. Rusty, how about taking us into step one? Okay, and that's the easiest step I do yes. with Kathy. Yes, okay, in step one, determine whether restitution is mandatory or discretionary. Now, we have statutes that provide for mandatory restitution and others that provide for possible discretionary restitution. And so let's look at those. The mandatory restitution statutes are 3663 capital A and special restitution statutes under Title 18. Now, 3663 capital A is a statute that was created by the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act back in 1996. And here's what is provided for there. Mandatory restitution for a crime of violence. A crime of violence is defined at Title 18, Section 16. For a property offense under Title 18. And for tampering with consumer products. Now, there are also some statutes in Title 18 uh, that we refer to as special restitution statutes. That's just a, a term we use just for easy reference. Uh, and let's look at what is covered under those statutes. Under Title 18, Section 2248, Sexual Abuse. 2259, Sexual Exploitation of Children. 2264, Domestic Violence. 2327, telemarketing fraud, and 228, child support. So those are the statutes that call for mandatory restitution. Now the statutes that provide for discretionary restitution are as follows. 3663, and as a condition of probation or supervised release, and that's under 3563 and 3583. Now, as far as 3563 is concerned, here's what's covered there. All other Title 18 offenses, that means all of the Title 18 offenses that weren't covered under mandatory restitution. Certain Title 21 drug offenses with identifiable victims, and also certain Title 21 drug offenses without identifiable victims, which is often referred to as community restitution. and certain Title 49 air piracy offenses. Now, there is also the availability for restitution as a condition of probation or of supervised release, and let's look at that. As a condition of probation or supervised release under 3565B2 and 3583D. Now, before I go further, let, let me make a point to you, please. Uh, if you order restitution under 3663 capital A or under one of the special restitution statutes in Title 18 or under 3663, under any of those sections, it's an order of restitution. And as an order of restitution, it is pretty much a freestanding sentence. Now, if you have an order of restitution, restitution having been ordered under one of those sections, uh, then necessarily it will become automatically a condition of supervision of probation or of supervised release, if the sentence includes probation or supervised release. But here, as far as discretionary restitution is concerned, we're talking about having restitution solely as a condition of probation or supervised release, not an order of restitution. And so it's distinct in that regard. Now, this is available for any offense. Now again, if you had an offense that fell under 3663 capital A or under one of the special restitution statutes, then obviously it's going to be mandatory restitution. But for any other offense, you can have restitution ordered solely as a condition of probation or of supervised release. For instance, you might have someone convicted under, say, Title 15, a, uh, a securities fraud violation, or Title 42, a social security fraud violation. Uh, those offenses are not covered under 3663A, under the special restitution statutes, or under 3663. 
but nonetheless there still could be restitution by way of solely a condition of probation or supervised release. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that there are still the limitations of 3663 and 3664 applicable. Uh, and basically that's going to be what we're going to be looking at now when we go through steps two through five. Those, uh, those restrictions and requirements are still going to be applicable even when it's a condition solely of probation or of supervised release. Now, Kathy, can you tell us just a little bit more about the distinctions between an order of restitution and, and restitution solely as a condition of probation or of supervised release and the advantages or disadvantages? Yes, uh, Rusty, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the primary advantage is the one you mentioned, that it can be imposed for any offense, but only as a condition, the way it used to be prior to the Victim Witness Protection Act. Uh, it wouldn't be, as you said, a freestanding component of the sentence or a separate, separate part of the sentence. Uh -huh. um, and it, the, another possible advantage is that conceivably you could change it, as you can change conditions under Rule 32.1, uh, and it's not as much finality. However, uh, we don't recommend this method of imposition if, there, if you can impose restitution as a separate component of the sentence uh, under 3663 or 3663A or one of those special statutes. And the primary reason we don't is because of its major drawback, and that is that it, it expires with the supervision. It's connected to it, so if the supervision expires or is revoked, the restitution obligation uh -huh. um, uh, dissolves, if you will, and doesn't carry on as it would as a separate standing component of the sentence. So for those reasons, we recommend using this only as a last resort, but it is very um, handy for certain offenses that you can't impose restitution any other way. Okay. Would you mind uh, taking us now through step one and how that would apply to our scenario? Rusty? Okay. Yeah, let's look at our scenario in step one. Which restitution statute controls, and why would that restitution statute control? And is it going to be mandatory or discretionary restitution as a result? Okay, we've got this push to talk technology with us here today, uh, so let's take advantage of that. Uh, who out there would like to take a shot at, at our step one using our scenario? Rusty? Yes. This is uh, Southern Ohio, Columbus, John Dierna, and uh, we believe that it's uh, 3663 capital A, and it's mandatory restitution. Okay, and John, uh, you decided that it was 3663 capital A. Uh, for what reason? Because the offense of conviction is a crime of violence. Okay, exactly. Uh, so, so I think that it was one of our easier uh, questions that we'll encounter here today. But thank you so much for that, John, and I'm glad that, uh, that this technology is working. Okay, uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and proceed to step two. Um, Rusty, you might want to wait a minute. Um, we do have a fax in that came in through the questions. Um, a fax came in from the Eastern Texas, and it is from Mike Thomas, and says, is there a statutory definition of property offenses under Title 18? And if not, is there case law which defines property offenses? I wish that had been pushed to talk so we would, could have had some technical difficulties there. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I'm going to defer to Kathy on that. Uh, I Kathy, knew you were well, going to do knew, that. You knew it was coming your way there. Absolutely, uh, yeah. What, what do you think, Kath? Uh, I'm not sure of that. I don't, I'm not aware of a definition of property crimes. I'm sure there ha has been some litigation. I'm not aware in the restitution uh, context uh, that that is so because we've only had the um, differentiation here between mandatory and discretionary restitution that uh, made property crimes uh, mandatory for a few years and I just haven't seen any cases that make that particular distinction. I know the question has come up with say a money laundering case. Uh, my um, hunch is that probably any case that you are adding up the dollars and using a loss uh, amount uh, on one of the loss tables is is probably going to be a um, property case but maybe there might there might be exceptions okay 
Well, uh, with that, uh, Laurie, any other uh, faxes uh, here for us at this time? No, no, we don't have any right now. Okay, well then let's proceed on to uh, our next step. Let's look at step two. Step two is to identify the victims. Now the determination of victims, and this is for all restitution statutes, whether you're talking about 3663 capital A, uh, one of the special restitution statutes, 3663, or solely as a condition of probation or of supervised release. Victims are persons harmed by the offense of conviction. And then there's a little uncertainty if that's going to be limited to the elements of the offense of conviction or not. Now, Kathy, uh, th this idea of having to be you know, harmed by the offense of conviction and then even the idea of it being restricted perhaps to the elements, uh, could you give us a little insight into that? Yeah, I think it might be easiest just to talk about the scope of the offense of conviction first and then I'll, I'll go to the element okay. issue. Um, and this is one of our, our top three issues, as we said at the beginning of the program, that the identification of victims harms causation and then compensability. And this is actually the issue that probably courts have gotten reversed on more often than, than any of the others uh, because of the difference between restitution and relevant conduct. And here's, here's where you see it the most clearly. Um, there are some cases that I would want to refer you to uh, for reference on page 7 of the handout that I talked about before. Uh, and I'll just mention some of them briefly that I think might be noteworthy and then you can look at them later on. But these are some of the key cases on identif identifying victims. The Hayes case in the Fifth Circuit and Cobbs in the Eleventh are two, they're not real recent cases, they've been around a while because this is a pretty well established principle uh, that you have to go with only the offense of conviction. In both Hayes and Cobbs, the offense of conviction was possessing stolen or counterfeit credit cards and yet the court imposed restitution for the use of those cards and the restitution order was reversed on appeal and there are several other cases that have, have uh, held this in a similar situation because the offense did not involve the use of the cards. The defendant was simply convicted of possessing on a certain day, normally they use the day of arrest, of uh, the cards. Uh, that same principle has been um, uh, held to be true after the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act. It's one of the few cases we have after the MVRA and that's the Mencius case in the Fifth Circuit also mentioned on page 7. Same situation and the court said the MVRA has not changed this particular aspect of restitution. So this, the courts are, are strict when they look at the scope or the boundary of the offense of conviction. Um, there is a, another case that I think is very useful here that's the Blake case also mentioned on page four, uh, 7 excuse me, and that's the Fourth Circuit and it was written by Judge Wilkins who we saw just a little while ago and uh, we talked about this case at the conference in Florida in May that Lori mentioned at the beginning of the program. We wanted you to see the tape of that particular discussion. And when, when you're starting at the beginning of this concept, Blake is a wonderful case. It's a good teaching case because what Judge Wilkins does is he analyzes the Sentencing Reform Act issue of the victims as vulnerable victims which, which, under the guidelines at which time you, you consider all of relevant conduct and then he has both issues on appeal, are they victims for restitution? So it makes a beautiful contrast and um, he upholds the vulnerable victim adjustment and reverses the part of the restitution that had to do with the elderly women's purses, not the part, of course, that had to do with the use of the card because the conviction is use and not, not possession or theft. As a former prosecutor for 10 years, I know why you see an awful lot of cases where isn't it common to see uh, possession of stolen credit cards or possession of fraudulent credit cards. Uh, no matter what the facts, if they actually arrest the person and they've got these cards, that's what they like to plead them to because it's easy, right? I mean, it's, you just, it's a cost-benefit ratio. I mean, it's real easy to prove they had them on their person the day of the arrest. You don't have to get into the use and all of that. Well, that was before we had to consider restitution issues the way the law has been defined now. So the government needs to start thinking about this because if they are pleading them to just the possession, you're not going to get the restitution for the use of the card. Blake, uh, the offense of conviction in that case, is, as it might have been clear, 
was actually use of the cards, but the court was trying to impose restitution not only for the use, but the theft of the purses from um, the card holders. And that part of the restitution is what was um, reversed in, in Blake. Uh, you mentioned the how much um, does the offense of conviction have to have an element of a scheme. This is one area that is a little confusing to, uh, at times under the law. The expander that restitution has uh, relevant conduct is the expander for guideline computation. The, the expander, if you will, for restitution purposes might be considered the provision that has to do with awarding restitution for the entire scheme, conspiracy, or pattern of behavior as long as that is an element of the offense. The statute provides that, um, the, that it needs to be an element. In most cases, most courts have taken that rather seriously. That's why we didn't have an expansion uh, of the uh, restitution in Blake and some of these other cases beyond what was actually uh, in the offense of conviction. It was not a conspiracy count. There was not a, an element that would have that expander in it. I would note, though, in reading the cases in the eight, uh, in the, um, across the country, the Eighth Circuit has some cases I've cited at page seven that seem to not be uh, scrutinizing the offense of conviction for this element aspect as um, strictly as other circuits, and those are listed there. They look more to does the scheme, does the scope of the evidence in the at proof at trial or in the indictment, they'll use phrases like that, show that this was a scheme or a conspiracy or pattern. So just know there is a little bit of, of uh, uh, disparity in, in the way that's being interpreted, but by and large it needs to be an element. Now, Rusty, there's two other cases I wanted to mention, both cited sure. on page seven that I think might be helpful to our viewers. One of them is the MacArthur case in the 11th Circuit, and that had to do with the um, possession, felon in possession of a firearm was the offense of conviction. And th originally there had been a 924C charge that was acquitted, and there was a victim who was injured by the shooting of the gun uh, in the altercation that uh, gave rise to this conviction. Uh, the court understandably uh, imposed restitution for the medical uh, cost to the, the victim of the shooting, but the circuit court reversed the restitution, uh, say, saying the same thing just in the credit card cases, that, that this was an offense of possession of the gun and not of a use of the gun. And I also cite a case on the seven, uh, on, excuse me, on page seven, the Cuban case, that uh, it goes the other way in the relevant conduct context with the felon in possession offense. So it shows that it, you know, what you do with this victim it, it changes whether you're looking for restitution or whether you're, you're looking for guideline computation in a felon in possession count. And then lastly, in a slightly different issue, one, one of the things we get a lot of questions on, Rusty, is identifying victims in boiler room telemarketing cases where there are an awful lot of victims and sometimes you have sketchy information about them and how far do you have to go? You could literally identify victims perhaps into the future um, inf indefinitely. The only case that I've seen that really helps us with a telemarketing case like this is the Grimes case that is on page seven, Seventh Circuit, it's very recent, 1999. And they, they give us some interesting guidance. First of all, it's the court identified everyone, all the victims it could by the time of sentencing and then that was it. <laughs> They were actually were reversed uh, for not using the 90-day continuance provision that came in with the Mandatory Victims Restitution Act, and the, and the appellate court said that the courts have to uh, use every means they can to identify as many victims as possible and using this provision. But then they seem to imply that that's it. You don't have to go forever, that if you have done this 90-day continuance and done everything you can, that there are provisions for coming back in for newly discovered losses and that you you don't, um, the de defendant deserves some finality, in other words, so, but they, they urge the courts to use that, that new provision that came in with the MVRA. The other thing I think is interesting is the provision itself and the court uh, quoting this provision talks about identifying victims, not necessarily locating or finding them. Sometimes that takes a little extra time, but we think you need to at least have some indication that you're going to be able to find them, some identifying factors by them. But I think the Grimes case might be helpful for any of you that have a telemarketing case. Good. You want to take us on into uh, the scenario now, applying this step two let's, with let's this case let's, law. Let's utilize our scenario and, and try and use step two. And the question we have is, 
Who are the victims of the offense of conviction of robbery? How about the bank? Okay, anyone out there want to uh, tell me why you think the bank would or would not be a victim of this offense of conviction of robbery, and if so, why? They're a little hesitant out there, Kathy. Let's see, Too we easy. actually know who you are. Too uh, easy. Let's see, we have uh, Buffalo, New York. We know that y'all are, are wired up with us today. Uh, how about it, Buffalo? I okay, had trouble in, in understanding that, didn't you, Kathy? Uh, Did you say something? Well, uh, maybe I'll call on someone else. How about Louisville, Kentucky? San Antonio, Texas is here. San Antonio. The home of the San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> uh, Mike Fisher speaking. Um, we think the bank is a victim because it was directly and approximately harmed. Okay, now San Antonio, thank you, Mike, is saying that yes, they think the bank is a victim of the offense of conviction of robbery, and certainly uh, from having listened to Kathy's uh, discussion, uh, you've got the elements of the offense of robbery, uh, those things that happened during the force and intimidation and taking property of a federally insured institution, that sure seems to encompass this bank. Uh, so so uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for, uh, for answering that for our first potential victim there. How about tellers A, B, and C? Uh, you know, are the tellers going to be considered? And, and let's take them one at a time, at least initially. Uh, are, are the tellers going to be victims of this offensive conviction? Uh, anyone else want to take a stab at it out there? The Northern District of um, Illinois, Chicago. We believe teller A is a victim. Okay, now uh, Chicago's weighing in. They say they think Teller A would be a victim. Uh, do you have a reason as to why you would include Teller A as being a victim? Because um, she received a laceration to her leg, um, had to go to the hospital, and then she had a staph infection that incurred uh, more costs regarding treatment. Okay, now actually uh, you, you may be answering question step two and maybe actually steps three and four as well here perhaps. But uh, for step two purposes, uh, yes, uh, I would agree that in the establishment of the force and the intimidation that are part of the elements of this offense of conviction of robbery, uh, th th this teller, teller A initially, uh, was, was uh, brought in to that, uh, to that parameter. So teller A would be. Uh, does anyone think that tellers B and C would be any different from the analysis for teller A? This is Northern District of Texas, Carolyn Hodo. Um, we believe that te uh, tellers B and C both are victims, same as teller A, basically for the same reason. They were all harmed during the course of their um, duties as a teller at the bank. So as such, we believe that yes, B and C are both victims as well. Okay, th thank you. Yes, in the establishment of the force and the intimidation, again, the, within the elements of the offense, uh, they were victims of this offense of conviction, as Kathy had conveyed to us. So I think the tellers would certainly be included as victims as well. Now let's look a little further. How about the owner of the auto that was stolen for a getaway car? Who wants to, to, to weigh in on that person? We're going to sit here with an uncomfortable silence, it looks like. <laughs> Uh, it, it, would anyone think that they would not be included? This is Ohio Southern, Dave Walden. 
Mm -hmm. You use the offense of conviction, you might say no, but this is a scheme circuit, so here I think we would take the position, yes, it would be included. Okay, now I think we had a little overlay there. I'm not really sure who answered the, the question that probably most of us heard, uh, but they were saying that because it was a scheme that they probably would include that. Uh, now, uh, again, as, as we discuss this case uh, among ourselves, uh, I know that in looking at the elements of the offense of robbery, you look at the establishment of the force and the intimidation and taking the property from this federally insured institution, uh, in looking at that, we could certainly include the bank, we certainly included the tellers, but then it was sort of hard to figure out how this owner of the automobile uh, fell within the, those parameters. Uh, you know, and, and we're going to come back to that in just a second uh, and maybe have Kathy uh, give us a little bit of her insight in that regard. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, potential victim, though, before we go to Kathy. The next potential victim being the customer. Uh, who would have included the customer? Now, I'm inclined to think that uh, the, the last respondent who said that uh, because the uh, owner of the getaway car somehow was swept up in the scheme, that you probably would have included the customer as well. A anyone else want to uh, uh, give their uh, indication as to whether they think the customer would be included as a victim of this offense of conviction of robbery? Rusty, this is Keith Hayes in Atlanta. Can you hear us? Oh, yes, I can always understand anyone from Atlanta. Go ahead. Yes, uh, we feel that he would be a victim of this offense. Uh, the money was taken from him by force within the bank, and the cash receipt deposit bag that he had was used in the uh, offense of the bank robbery. Okay, so, so during the establishment of the force and the intimidation of this robbery, uh, again, this person uh, w w was swept up at that. Uh, now, I had said that we were going to go to Kathy, maybe to get some of her insights. Kathy, I know we have this owner of the au automobile, and certainly that person mm -hmm. has been victimized. You have this guy inside the bank, the customer, and certainly that person is victimized. But with this analysis of looking at the offense of conviction, uh, was this person victimized by this offense of conviction? And particularly as you begin looking at the elements, uh, are these people probably going to be considered victims? And could our factual uh, situation be changed a little bit where that might include them or exclude them? I think this, these types of calls are going to be very fact-driven in all the cases. And maybe one of the reasons we put a couple on the line here is to illustrate that, that, that the answer may vary, uh, not only with courts, uh, but uh, across the country and, and according to the facts that you have, I am inclined to think the customer is more likely to be included than the car owner. Uh, and I know there are pre-MVRA cases that, that uh, rule out the owner of, of getaway cars and bank robberies. We actually have a few on that point. But uh, we're not sure whether the new terms that were brought in with the MVRA in 1996 uh, might change some of this analysis slightly. I, my guess is uh, that we don't think it's going to uh, change it dramatically. It might uh, around the edges. Where, uh, for example, the customer, if the customer is uh, uh, robbed inside the bank uh, during the course of the intimidation and even as the robbers are leaving to continue intimidating everyone, that, that's probably going to be close enough to the in, within the offense to be considered for restitution purposes with most courts, but if the customer were robbed out on the sidewalk, leaving, or worse yet, out in the parking lot, there, there comes a time when, when you're not within the course of the robbery, and it would be included for irrelevant conduct purposes. Right, Don't get me wrong, but certainly. it would, for restitution, the courts have, have uh, interpreted the statutory term offensive conviction to be much stricter than what we do with the guidelines under the relevant conduct concept. Uh, but I will say that it's hard. The one way that our steps blur occasionally is you might, under the analysis approximately, for example, under the new terms we're going to get to a little bit later, uh, bring in some of these uh, borderline uh, um, victims, uh, especially like a customer, let's say, that's robbed on the way out of the bank, for example. I'm not sure whether it would go as far as the, as the car owner or not. Okay. And Judge Wilkins, in the Blake case, I might say, laments. In the case, he says that we, we are not real happy with this result, but this is uh, a statutory construction issue, and um, this is the way the courts are interpreting it. now. The caller that said you're in the scheme district I, circuit, I assume you meant you're from the Eighth Circuit, and I have to admit there's a couple Eighth Circuit cases that might, under these facts, include the car owner. Oh, I see. 
So it, it does vary by fact. Okay, you are, are there any questions about our, our step two that we just have gone through? Uh, for those of you with push to talk, any questions out there? I hear a little bit of clicking, but I don't hear any, any talking, so I'm assuming that they're still yeah. with us up to this point. I, I realize what happened with Buffalo and Louisville. They were marked as not being connected, and we thought the mark meant you were connected, so our apologies in oh. absentia to Louisville and Buffalo. But now we're reading our list right, so we'll okay. know who to call It's on not that time. they didn't want to talk. They right. just didn't have the capability. They weren't there. Okay, <laughs> so we know you know the answer out there. Okay, well, that being the, the case, uh, then let's go back to Laurie. Okay, well now we're um, about to take our five minute break. Um, so please keep your faxes coming. I should mention before uh, that we do have uh, some faxes in. In fact, we got some yesterday and this morning. So we are getting them in. We just want to uh, include them in the appropriate step. That's why we're holding off on asking them right now. But please fax your questions in and uh, take a five minute stretch or so and we'll see you back in five.
Welcome. Well, welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your stretch for uh, five minutes or so. We haven't received any new faxes, so I'll just turn it back over to uh, Kathy and Rusty. Here we are. Yeah, glad to be back with you. And uh, we're going to resume, uh, and we'll begin looking at step three. Step three is identify the harms to the victims. And here the issue, as we mentioned earlier, is the causation of harms. And the harm must be caused by the offense of conviction. And then we have these words directly and proximately that were introduced by the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act back in 1996. A little uncertainty there because we think they can expand or limit the harms that will be included. Probably will slightly expand. Now, these terms directly and proximately, Kathy was even making a little reference to those when we talked about you know, mm -hmm. step two. But in step three, that's really where we feel that language probably comes into play, and so we've held it off to this step that we're looking at now. Unfortunately, directly and proximately is not defined for us by the statutes. And there's only limited case law since the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act that gives us some insight. Now, Kathy, I know your document gives us a, a, a lot of case law and a lot of issues regarding restitution, uh, but there's not much there on uh, this issue about directly and proximately. Uh, can you give us your insight as to what you think perhaps uh, uh, directly and proximately is going to end up meaning? Okay, this is uh, uh, educated guessing, but we're, we'll do the best we can. We, the, one of the few clues we have is some legislative history, and the legislative history talks about that there must be a clear causal link between the harm and the offense of conviction. That's not real helpful, but at least it, it is telling us that there needs to be some, uh, a close, uh, a clear link, not, not a, a maybe link. Uh, directly and proximately are, are, are different. Directly conjures up the idea of nothing interfering, a, a direct line of causation, uh, no unrelated intervening causes, if you will. So uh, uh, one of the cases we're going to talk about talks about intervening causes, and they say that it's not direct if something comes in and it's not related to that. But if it's related, it's still in the direct line of causation. Sometimes we talk about but-for causation, uh, one of those lawyers' favorite terms, uh, meaning uh, you know cause and effect. Everything you do now has an effect, a ripple effect downstream somewhere. But as a society, in tort law and in contract law and in criminal law to a certain extent, we decide to draw the line on liability for someone at some point that is reasonable for that and not just infinitely into the future. And causation, we normally call that line the proximate cause line. And the second word we're dealing with here is proximately, which brings up the, the idea of proximate cause and to in the law, that usually means the line of the, at which we're going to hold someone liable because normally there was a, a reasonably foreseeable uh, aspect to it that the defendant could foresee that the harm was going to result from, could have or should have foreseen that the harm was going to result from his or her conduct. Um, and uh, it's, it can't be too far removed in time or space or facts, so in other words, it's proximate, close in relationship. Um, the, but we have very, very few cases on this, Rusty, as you mentioned. There are a couple, and I wanted to bring uh, the viewer's attention to some cases on page 8. I've collected some of the more recent cases on causation. There are a few beginning to come down, and actually we have a couple that actually mention the word proximately in it and begin to give us some analysis there. Uh, the first case I wanted to mention is the Menza case on page 8. That's in the Seventh Circuit. And uh, it's a, an interesting case uh, to remember the fact scenario. It kind of helps make the point that the harms for restitution have to be caused by the offense and can't include uh, harm beyond what was caused by the offense. 
in the Menza case, Rusty, the defendant had a meth lab in his apartment unbeknownst to the authorities until it exploded and caused the uh, significant dam to the, damage to the uh, apartment. Uh, he was eventually convicted of the meth con uh, offense. And then when it got around to restitution time, the court ordered restitution to the landlord, landlord for cleaning up the apartment after the explosion and getting ready for the next tenant. And to the government, I think it was the DEA, for uh, disposing of all the chemicals that were found at the site, some of them legal and some illegal. The Court of Appeals, and this is just last year in 1998, reversed the restitution order and sent it back for the court to determine how much of those harms were actually caused by the offense, the meth lab offense. In other words, the landlord had some expense always in turning over an apartment to the next owner, so the court would have to go and back out the usual or routine expense. And as far as the government uh, destroying the chemicals or disposing of the chemicals, the court said this is what the government does. It's their business to do this. This wasn't extraordinary in this case over other drug cases that the agency had to, to uh, destroy. Now, I don't want anyone to get confused that this was not reversed on the basis that the government can't be a victim. It's just that under these facts, uh, the government wasn't a victim for disposing of these chemicals. So that shows you how how strictly some of the courts are drawing the line here. Uh, on the other hand, there's uh, on the same vein, actually, is the Cottman case, also cited on page 8 in the Third Circuit. There's several other cases, too, as well, that hold that uh, restitution cannot include buy money. Buy money is money that the government gives a defendant for buying uh, in a reverse thing drugs or guns or something like that. And then, of course, the government would like to have this money back. And what the courts have said is, uh, it's better to impose a fine if that's the case, but the government really isn't a victim in the sense of having had this harm caused to them. This is their cost of doing business. So buy money is a particular situation that we do have several cases on, we do get questions on. That one is pretty well settled. I'm going to a little bit deeper level of analysis here. I wanted to point out the, the Mexian case on page 8, Ninth Circuit. Uh, 1999, very recent, and actually, as far as I know, one of the only cases that talks directly about, well, actually, in this case, the term directly. <laughs> and uh, it, it says that it's not under the uh, Mandatory Victim Restitution Act, but that the, the difference wouldn't have been, that the outcome wouldn't have been different, the court said. So in a way, they are saying this, that they don't think the words approximately added to that would make any difference. What Mexian does is give us a wonderful analysis of intervening causes. And sometimes, a lot of times, you'll have one cause, and then you have something that comes along and adds to that or exacerbates that cause. And if it is related to the original conduct, what the Mexian court says, is you, that is included into the harm. Whereas if it is unrelated, such as a market price going up or down drastically, something un uh, ca not caused by the defendant, then it wouldn't be included in the, the restitution harm. And the, uh, the uh, Ninth Circuit examines four fact scenarios, the one in the case and then three others of its prior cases, reconciles them all and say, showing how two of them had related intervening causes and two of them had non-related. An example of a related intervening cause was a defendant who um, uh, assaulted uh, a victim well, a better one might be a defendant who uh, talked a couple of co-conspirators into assaulting somebody and then threatening them, and then they got carried away and went ahead and kidnapped and actually it resulted in the death of one of the victims. And the defendant argued, I only asked them to, th I gave them these guns and I asked them to go threaten this person and they did the rest. They added to it. They were what you might call an intervening causation or, or a cause. And the court held that, no, this was too closely related. It was an additional fact, but that it wouldn't have happened but for his uh, starting them in motion, and he could have, should have foreseen or should have known that they might get carried away and go further. So that would be a, a related intervening cause. The Mexian case had to do with uh, a bad loan, uh, false statements on a loan, but where the bank got a bad environmental impact uh, study and didn't know that the property was uh, polluted. And when the defendant 
defaulted on the loan, they couldn't recover their money because of the environmental problem. And so there was an, an unrelated intervening cause. So some of you are going to get some cases as people focus on restitution more and more that have more than one cause. And you need to analyze it in terms of how close connected to the original offense conduct, which is what you're focusing on for restitution, these other factors are. In our scenario, for example, uh, we have some intervening cause having to do with the uh, uh, staff infection that we're going to analyze in just a minute, okay. and you're going to work with the, the callers and, and see what you think about that. But that might be considered an intervening cause. Another thing I wanted to mention on page 8 is the Hayes case. The second, this is another Hayes case, uh, Second Circuit case. And, and this case, I think, is very helpful. It's last year, very recent, and it, uh, explaining two things. One is that costs can be restitution as well as harms. Uh, that's why we, in our steps, we've, we've started saying harms and costs. Because in this case, it was the cost of the victim to obtain a temporary restraining order. And then the, the defendant then later violated the temporary, temporary restraining order and crossed the state lines, and that was the offense for which he was convicted under the domestic violence statutes. And the defendant argued that this cost to the victim occurred prior to his conduct. And how could it be caused by the conduct if it happened even before, much less outside the time frame? And the, um, the Second Circuit didn't have any problem upholding that restitution. Uh, they said that, that there are other types of restitution that is compensable, and we'll get to that in our next step, but this is a little preview for that, that occur after conduct. For example, the witnesses' fees and, and testifying uh, and expenses and cooperating with the investigation. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be right during the conduct. And this was tightly tied to the conduct and actually a necessary predicate for the conduct. So they upheld the, uh, the expense. They were also dealing with one of those special restitution statutes that has slightly different wording in it, having to do with all losses, which we want to keep in mind. So it may or may not be uh, applicable or analogized to other cases. And then finally, the last case is kind of an, a reassuring case, the Saposnik case in the Seventh Circuit on page 8. Um, I think it's reassuring because the, the circuit court is, is telling us here that you don't have to be rocket scientists, that this is the uh, best estimate that you can come up with for restitution is, is good enough if, you, if that's all you can do. In the Saposnik case, they had a uh, what was otherwise a very popular and well-received effective police chief of a small town who received some bribes uh, during the course of his four years as police chief. And uh, so a portion of the services that he rendered the city were corrupt, if you will, as a cause of this offense. And the court was tasked with trying to figure out how much restitution should be imposed as how much of a measure of the four years service was a result of this corruption and how much of it wasn't because everyone agreed evidently that there was some good service provided as well. The court awarded one of the four years salary as restitution for the police chief to pay to the city and this was upheld. So uh, there are some cases coming down, beginning to come down that are quite interesting that would maybe give you guidance if you have a case such as one of these that you could apply the reasoning to. Rusty, how about taking us through our bank robbery scenario now, giving us a big clue on the intervening causes issue. Okay. Maybe it'll help out uh, applying this step. Be glad to do it. Uh, let, let's look at step three and how we apply that. Identify the harms to the following victims of the offensive conviction of robbery. The bank. Okay, again, going back to push to touch, uh, push to talk, uh, if y'all will uh, give us your, your insights. Uh, what do you think the harms were to the bank here in this case? Okay, I believe they took the break and didn't come back yet. <laughs> let, let me see who's watching with us here. Uh, how about Grand Rapids, Michigan? We have you listed as being on push to talk. Uh, do you have any harms that you think the bank suffered that you think were directly and proximately caused by this offensive conviction of robbery? Okay, uh, how about one of the New York uh, locations? Maybe we're still reading the list wrong. 
<laughs> Kathy, it looks like I may have to answer this myself. <laughs> Okay, uh, the harms to the bank that we think were directly or approximately caused. Uh, certainly the loss of bank loot. They had bank monies that were taken. We think that would be a loss. Uh, we had damage to the teller's cages th that occurred. Uh, we think that would be loss. Uh, it would be harm. Uh, and we also had the harm that resulted in the destruction of the uh, security system that the bank had. Uh, so those are what we think would be the harms that were suffered by the bank as a direct or proximate cause of this offense of conviction. Uh, now, having looked at the bank, let's see what other victims we've identified and what harms they have suffered. Tellers A, B, and C. Again, I think we'll have to take these separately uh, because of the different harms that, that they may have suffered. Teller A, uh, who would like to, to say what harms you think Teller A suffered? Uh, we've identified Teller A as a victim now, so now we have to, at our next step, that we're under step three, uh, determine what were those harms directly or proximately caused. Rusty, Hello? this is Ohio Southern, Columbus. Uh, we would say that the medical bills would be covered, as well as the uh, lost wages. Okay, uh, thank you, Ohio Southern. Uh, it really, you might be jumping almost into step four for us because right now we're just trying to identify the harms. I'm going to assume that since you think that those were, were things that would be uh, compensable, uh, that you think the harms were the physical injury uh, to Teller A, uh, as well as the uh, loss of the sick leave uh, to Teller A. Uh, so I'm going to make that assumption from what you're saying. Now, in, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the uh, injuries to Teller A, are you talking just about the laceration to the leg, or are you talking as well about the, uh, the, the uh, staph infection that was uh, contracted and the person was further hospitalized? Oh, we're talking about both. Okay, you're talking about both. So, so, so you think that uh, uh, cer certainly the laceration to the leg seems to be uh, an easier call, but even the, uh, the staph infection that occurred once the person went to the hospital, you think that that would be included as well? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, now, Kathy, uh, I, I know you mentioned earlier when you were talking about the case law uh, that uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the staph infection that has occurred, it has to be directly or approximately. Uh, and I know you even mentioned a case one time where the person had gone to the hospital and something else occurred. You want to yeah. talk just a little bit about that? Uh, actually, that happened here in D.C. <laughs> uh, to show you fact is stranger than fiction. Um, a stabbing victim was in the emergency room, and the emergency room caught fire. Uh, and was burned, and uh, of course it wasn't. A, w they weren't analyzing restitution, but there is a, a famous uh, restitution case that talks about a rape victim uh, being injured in the fire of the hospital. Uh, that would be what we might call an intervening cause. There is cer it's certainly, but for her being raped or being stabbed, these people would not have been there to be harmed. So it is in the line of causation. But like I say, in civil law and criminal law, we draw the lines of liability along some sort of approximate cause line where we look at was it reasonable that this might be foreseen, for example, or is it just a natural, n another way to look at it is, is it a natural consequence of the actions? Does it almost always follow or often follow? Uh -huh. Though in the case of the fire, probably not. That would be a, a big leap. But in the case of a staph infection, I could imagine there'd be some testimony at, on this issue in such a case as to how often staph infections are contracted in hospitals if it's something that is that is reasonably foreseeable that would follow in the natural course there wasn't anyone else there causing that necessarily right. in an intentional way you don't have any intended um, defendants coming in with a ma malice uh, doing anything this has happened and it was a r result of this and it happens frequently enough to be considered an, a consequence of it I think it would be considered okay. part of it. Okay, so, 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 so the harms to Teller A uh, were the uh, loss of the sick leave uh, and then also the, uh, the, the injuries, uh, both the injuries from the uh, laceration and from the staph infection. Uh, any other harm to Teller A? Or costs that, that were incurred? Okay, well, the court appearance is, is what I'm sort of fishing for. I mean, she, she, she lost... Uh, uh, money related to having to make court appearances in, in our scenario. Now, how about for Teller B? Anyone want to uh, say what harms you think were suffered by Teller B? 
Hello? Yes. This is uh, the Northern District of Texas uh, in Dallas, home of the Dallas Stars, by the way. Uh, Teller B uh, incurred the um, psychological trauma, which would be direct harm. Okay. Any Thank other? You. Any other harm to tell her B? Well, the, the, the court appearances. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we were looking for for teller B. Uh, how about for teller C? Okay, I think teller C was just the court appearances, as I recall from the scenario. Those were the only harms that the uh, teller C suffered as a result. Let's continue on looking at our victims. How about the customer? What were the harms that were suffered by the customer? Anyone out there with the push to talk site and you say, well, why did we bother getting push to talk? This is the Northern District of Illinois, Chicago, home of the Cubs uh, and the Bears and the Chicago Fire. Uh, we believe the customer um, had the $300 in court costs and uh, and ice packs. And we got broke off on that answer. Were you saying something about... I think they were having too much fun. Uh, yeah, they're having a lot of fun in Chicago. <laughs> they just couldn't stick with the answer long <laughs> enough. But yes, okay, uh, so, so, so the loss of the money, the money in the uh, bank bag, uh, the, 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 the injuries uh, to, to the uh, teller, I mean, to, to the customer, and then uh, the court cost appearances, the court appearance cost. So uh, th those were our, our victims and the harms that were suffered by those victims. Now you notice in our analysis, here's where you're doing step three, that we haven't listed the owner of the car that was stolen for a getaway. Uh, the reason for that is back at step two, we didn't include the car owner as having been a victim. So once you exclude someone from having been a victim, uh, then when you get to step three, then there's no analysis required for that particular person because they aren't a victim. We just do this analysis based on those having been determined to be victims. I will add, Rusty, that occasionally you need to go to this step to help you analyze the victim, too. They overlap in a couple of these cases. Uh, where you're looking at the causation to de decide uh, how broad to draw the lines. But we thought, remember, we tried the steps in several different orders, and we thought this was the best okay. order to leading to the best result most of the time. Okay, good. So, 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 so there can be a little, a little fuzzing bit, between yeah. the lines yes, of the steps. there is. Okay, that's, that's a good point to make. Any questions out there before we move to step four? You didn't have any answers, so maybe yes, you've got questions. Yes, I do have a question. And Northern that, District of Texas. This is regarding the uh, car owner. If there was some evidence or some way to establish that the bank robber stole that car specifically to use during the course of the bank robbery, could he be considered as a victim under those circumstances? Well, again, uh, the analysis, as I understand it, and Kathy, I'll yeah. certainly uh, let you jump in here as well. Uh, we were trying again in determination as to whether someone was a victim or not. We looked to the offense of conviction and the elements of the offense. Uh, and while that car may have been stolen for purposes of use in the robbery, it didn't seem to fall within the establishment of force and intimidation and the taking of the properties that were federally insured. I don't know, Kathy, would you that, have a different That's read? where we are right now in our analysis, but I would encourage you to at least frame this issue for your courts because there may be some courts that would be willing to push the envelope a little bit with the new language of directly and proximately harmed. And if I, I gather you're post postulating a situation where uh, the car is stolen only for that, they steal it and, and almost immediately go and or it has some characteristic that's useful for them for that bank robbery and that's the only reason they stole it for and it's close in time. Those are the kind of facts that I think might, might um, allow a court to maybe ex expand the approximately analysis in, in to including that car owner. I'm just saying I think most courts, at least on past case law, would not have included that. Uh -huh. 
so, so if that is indeed the case, if that were to occur, it really would be that the courts would then start taking almost what we see currently as being step three and incorporating that more into step two, uh, yes. using uh, the proximate uh, determination more in making us the determination as to who is a victim. That's right, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, that being the case, uh, let, let's proceed on to uh, step four. Step four is determine which of the harms and or costs that we've now identified are compensable according to the statutes. And the various statutes provide for certain things to be compensable. And of course, something has to be compensable under the statutes for there to be an order of restitution for that harm. So let's look at those. Compensable harms and costs under 3663A, 3663, and as a condition of probation or as supervised release. For property loss, return or pay for that property. For bodily injury or death, the medical expenses, the professional expenses, the lost income, funeral expenses, things of that nature. And then any cost incurred by victims related to participation in the investigation and the prosecution of the case. Now, the special restitution statutes that we've talked about earlier, uh, those have a little different language. Actually, it seems a little broader. So let's look at that. Compensable harms and costs for the special restitution statutes. All losses suffered by the victim as a proximate result of the offense. And then additional specific losses are even included at three of those special restitution statutes that would broaden it even further. Okay, now that being the case, uh, let's go to uh, our uh, final uh, uh, scenario step here, step four, and, and see what the uh, outcome would be. Determine which of the identified harms to the following victims are authorized for restitution. The bank. Okay, now we've identified some harms to the bank. Uh, so wh which of those harms are going to be compensable? Uh, anyone want to tell us, looking at the various harms we've identified that were suffered by the bank, which ones will be compensable? This is Virginia Eastern in Alexandria. Um, the loss of the money that wasn't recovered and the damage to the bank's property. Okay. Okay, now Eastern Virginia, you, you say that the loss to, to the bank of the bank's uh, property. Uh, I'm a you have to have it on all 40. Okay, yeah, I, I think you're still holding the push to talk, man, which sort of keeps us from being able to converse with you there. Uh, so, so the loss of the bank's property, uh, the bank loot, uh, in that regard, uh, since $10,000 was recovered, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about $10,000 uh, would be uh, compensable to the bank in terms of the bank loot. And you mentioned the damage to the teller's, uh, pro to the, excuse me, to the bank's property. Uh, now, the bank had damage to their property in a couple of ways. They had the damage to the teller's cages, and they also had the uh, damage to the uh, security system. Now, I don't know that there's any issue about the, it being $1,000 that would be compensable for the teller's cage, uh, but Eastern Virginia, did you have a dollar figure that you associated with the uh, uh, restitution for the security system? No, but I don't think they should be able to upgrade their system and get all that. Um, I'm not sure they should be able to get all of it for the upgraded system. Now I okay. Uh, yeah, the, 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 I assume everyone picked up on that. That he didn't think that they should be able to be able to upgrade their system. Uh, now, of course, the, the bank had a, a security system they bought 15 years ago, state of the art. Uh, they could replace that very same system today for I think it was like $40,000. Uh, but that wouldn't meet banking standards. They couldn't open their doors and operate with that system. Uh, so they would have to buy a system that cost at least, as I recall, $225,000 to be operational once again. Uh, but they said, we don't ever buy, you know, just the low-end equipment. We always buy state-of-the-art. It's more uh, economical for us in the long run to do so. 
uh, it's better business, and so we always buy state of the art as we did last time, and it's 300,000. That is what they purchased. So uh, I'm assuming from what you're saying, Eastern Virginia, you don't think they should have been able to buy the 300,000 state of the art. Uh, how much lower, though, did you think that uh, that would be compensable? 225,000. Okay. Now 225,000. In the 225,000, and you think 225,000 uh, for what reason? Because certainly that is a more expensive system than even they had before. It's a replacement cost. Okay, now Kathy, in terms of this idea of replacement cost, uh, you know, here they had the system. We've talked about the various dollar figures associated. Uh, to give them a system uh, this expensive, $225,000, what would be the justification for that under the statute? The statute talks about in the case of property loss or damage to uh, return the property, or when that's not possible, replace it with the greater of either the amount of the property what it was worth at the time of the offense or at the time of sentencing. Now, it doesn't really help us that much for this situation. Uh, a lot of times statutes <laughs> are difficult to apply to real life. Um, uh, what is the, uh, the replacement cost, as the caller um, from Virginia said? Uh, there, there's an issue as to what you're going to replace it with. There, most of the time you can replace things with, in several different ways. And in this case, we set the scenario in such a way that it, the prior equipment that was damaged was grandfathered in, if you will, I guess under the current regulations, and the regulations have gone up, and maybe the next time they got certified or whatever, they would have to meet them. But th for the time being, they were, they were operating with what would not now be qualified equipment. So to replace that wouldn't really put the victim in the place that the victim bank was prior to the offense. It would give them the physical equipment, maybe, but if it wasn't certifiable, they couldn't operate it. So mm -hmm. I think most courts would say that this was not restoring the victim to the way that the victim was before. And the main point I wanted to make is actually the, the term and concept related to the term and concept of restitution. And underlying it is the concept of restoration, restitution. They come from the same root word as far as I <laughs> know. I hope that's <laughs> true. But uh, it sounds like they do. Uh, and the idea is not to punish the defendant, it's not to make the victim better, even if the victim would claim, and they probably would, that we wouldn't have realized we needed the better system but for this offense uh, occurring and that it saves us money in the long run. I think that the proper restitution amount is the amount that would bring the victim up to what the victim had before the offense, which was an operating system. So in this case, I would lean toward the $225 um, award. Okay, good. Uh, we have uh, some other uh, victims we'll look at and see what the harms were to those victims that are going to be compensable. Uh, tellers A, B, and C. Uh, now for teller A, we've identified some harms to teller A. Uh, for which of those harms are going to be compensable? Who wants to? weigh in on that. Hi, this is the Northern District. Uh, would not her, her medical expenses of $3,000 and then the $15,000 for the staph infection plus the court appearance for $300. Okay, and, and then how about uh, the, uh, the uh, sick leave that was lost? Yes, sir, that also. Um, and that was $800, but my question was, or is, is that not the bank's loss? But, well, I'm not certain of that. Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, th this woman, she was out of work for a week. She used her sick leave, and, and using her sick leave, she got the $800 that she normally would have gotten uh, for being at work during that week. Uh, Kathy, uh, how does that play out? In other words, this woman got her money. How would that be restitution to this, to this woman? She's a victim. She had this harm. Uh, but is there something there that's going to be compensable? Can I jump ahead to one of my cases and <laughs> bail myself out? Okay. There's a case on page 10 that actually uh, addresses this, a Jacob's case. I had to do with annual leave uh, and the, the victim of a bodily injury uh, 
suffered bodily injury. Uh, one of the things that you can compensate for bodily injury is lost income or wages, and the court said that the value of the annual leave that she took for the injuries uh, was income to her, you know, that you, that's worth a certain amount of money. Uh, I, too, have thought, how would that actually be, who would that be paid to? And um, I, I, either that the, if the bank would reconstitute her leave and so that she ha basically gets that money, that time paid for and give her another week's leave, then maybe the bank would be uh, compensated, but otherwise she would be compensated because she had used that leave. So at least you have one case, very recent, Jacobs 1999, um, dealing with annual leave and it looks like uh, especially if you have the statute to to tie it to and there under bodily injury you have the lost income lost wages terms in the statute that the court used to compensate and and they were upheld okay uh, how about for teller b uh, which of those harms to teller b will be compensable this is keith hayes in atlanta we believe that if you can define psychological harm as a bodily injury, you can compensate her for the $4,000. But you have to define psychological injury as bodily injury. That's an excellent point you make down there. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, that's been one of the, the things that we aren't so certain uh, that Teller B is going to get uh, compensated for. Uh, because the statute requires that to be compensated for psychiatric care, it has to have resulted from physical injury. And Teller B, in our scenario, did not suffer any physical injury. Uh, now, if the physical injury can somehow, uh, or if the psychological injury can somehow be shown to be almost a, a manifestation of some kind of uh, physical injury, or, or to have manifested itself in some kind of physical injury, perhaps that might be a, a possibility. Uh, otherwise,